This week's scenario is Extraction, from the 2016 Steamroller Package. This scenario does consist of the kill box artifice, and has two flags, which can be controlled for one CP or dominated for one CP, and the enemy objective can be destroyed for one CP. Victory conditions consist of five control points or caster assassination. Hello, this is Erlich W, and this week I decided to bring Asphyxius the Hellbringer. Complimented by Deathjack, Reaper, Erebus, Cakeworm, who always travels with, with Exusius. Some Carrion Thralls, and some Raiders, because they just go together with the Exusius like bread and butter. Pokey here, and I am going back to one of my uh, favorite casters, Makeda 3. You probably know, I you'd like to use her all the time. Dowdark helped me create this list, I'm trying to work off of some of the uh, abilities that are built into it with the, the beasts and the feet, and let's see if it, how well it works. All right, I actually won the roll to go first, and uh, I opted to go first. Um, my thought process behind that was, um, my faction is, my force is kinda, kinda slow. Well, not too slow, but some of the key pieces are kinda slow. And uh, I wanted to make sure I was in a, in a good position early to uh, put some threat onto him so he's not able to just run up, run up the board at me and, and uh, you know, keep me away from scoring. Um, so it'll be very interesting to see if I'm able to have that plan work well. For deployment of the Crix army, I start by putting a Reaper in the middle, as well as Sixtius. I figure I'm going to put most of my battle group near the middle and have them go up the, the, the center. The plan is to screen them with the Sitsixis because of Cloak of Ash, they're incredibly hard to hit. And they'll also be flanking with Carrion Thralls on the far right flank. The ideal is to either jam my opponent before he can get to the flags, or to at least make him waste his attacks on the Raiders and the Carrion Thralls, allowing my battle group to go ahead and pick off any of his battle group that gets out of position. Alright, Soldier's placement is to put him close enough to the Gladiator to get Rush, so the Gladiator can still activate after, work, after putting up Rush uh, with a slam or a trample or a run or just a saunter forward. For advanced deployment, I decided to put Cake Worm and Death Jack on the left side, kind of behind the forest, that way they can kind of get some screening as they advance. Alright, turn one. Uh, turn one is going to be pretty simple. Pretty much everything is going to run. Um, like I said before, my hope was to get up the field, get a good presence um, on the field, and then uh, get, you know, force Iron Lich to to, to react to where I'm placed. Uh, you know, keeping his distances and, and whatnot from where I'm at versus um, me having to react to where, you know, all of his speed seven stuff, speed seven, speed eight, you know, jacks and infantry uh, with mobility or speed eight jacks. But his infantry is extremely fast. And uh, with me not having much infantry, it would be prefer preferable, uh, preferable to, uh, to have me in a better position up the field early. So, yeah, that's the, the reason for the advance like that. So, as you can tell, I've moved up all of my savages in kind of a wide fo uh, formation. Two behind the forest, because the last thing I need is him to bring Death Jack up and do something bad to me. And then the Gladiator actually put Rush up on the sentry, not the soldier. And then move forward, the, sold, the sentry ran up in front of the fence. Um, and now I activate Makeda, and she put up Rush on the soldier. The soldier then runs forward to get ahead and uh, ahead of the line anyways to try to do, uh, hopefully take up any shots that may come its way because of its carapace, 
Uh, Moloch Karn just advances, and when you saw me count my fury just a second ago, it uh, dawned on me that uh, I have uh, a little too much fear on the table. I'm sitting on four, and my front beasts are pretty much all ran, so that's four fury plus the four I have on me. Means I have two additional fury out. Oh, and as FYI, the soul word is not actually in this list. It did nothing, and we'll be removing it here shortly. Crick's turn one. So immediately seeing how my opponent's unpacking, I really decide that it doesn't change what I want to do. I notice that my opponent is really on a, only going to be able to contest at least my left flag, his right flag, with one or two units or models. By start with what I was going to do, which was to run the cannon thralls up the right flank into and near the, near the linear obstacles. Since they have flight, they ignore it. I want to keep them spread out. I know my opponent doesn't really have any eight weeds in this case, but at a good habit, go ahead and not get them too close. Once they're done, immediately go to the Raiders. You can do whipping winds to give them a plus two defense against range attacks, even though my opponent really doesn't have any, as well as immune to blast damage. And most of this is just out of habit. I have them run to be in position. I don't necessarily need Pathfinder because I only need both of them near the edge of the forest so they can charge out of it. So I go ahead and run them in position, thinking turn two is when I'm going to you know, heavily jam my opponent and then dump them. Alright, so with the units out of the way, focus on my battle group. I'm gonna thinking that I wanted to first activate Asphyxius, cast my ability so I can get my Reaper through the forest. My Reaper is probably gonna end up being the Sacrificial Jack in this list, or at least in this game. And I'm gonna wanna try to think how I want to play, because you know, right now you can see there's gonna be a heavy kill box. My opponent's obviously gonna sacrifice his Eridus bug. But I wanna make sure that I don't just throw away a jack. I wanna try and get the first jump on my opponent's army. So I'll measure out his threat distance, and I walk all my heavies basically up to about an inch just outside of it. Advance Cake and Worm, advance my Arc Node. I figure those two are probably going to fight it out for that left flag. And then kind of advance Death Jack. Make sure I keep my Necrotech in range so it can repair anyone who may take damage. And just run everyone else up into a position that's, that's pretty reasonable. Just as I had hoped, he had not advanced as far up as, as he could have. <clears throat> I, uh pulled my fury and luckily the savage on the bottom did not uh, frenzy and uh, but unfortunately the one on the top did um, now we kinda made a ruling because we couldn't find 100% for sure but we could not find anything in the rule book that said uh, or where we could find it anyways about uh, frenzying beast and line of sight luckily for me Nothing was in my line of sight for that one to frenzy on, so it kind of just stood there. Um, used to say the nearest, you know, nearest line of sight, blah, 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 blah. Well, this time there was nothing in there about, you know, within line of sight. So now I'm marking the one with uh, the fact that it frenzied, so I, I know I don't have to activate it or I shouldn't activate it. And now I'm trying to figure out. Is there a way to actually get to Death Jack? Because, well, Death Jack is scary. So is that Reaper. Um, I think I actually fear the Reaper a little more than Death Jack right now because the Reaper has the ability to drag. So once he harpoons me, pulls me in, well, there you go. Now I'm, at the, now I'm at, on his side without any of my own protection. So now I'm kind of trying to figure out the bug, uh, the soldier's uh, ultimate movement here uh, with Rush 
and charging. It's eight inches. If I had Hand of Fate, um, it allows me to, if I kill the one girl, it gives me the ability to um, overtake. So that's why I measured out the three, because the soldier has a two inch reach. <clears throat> so now we're going through all the the hems and haws of, you know, what can reach who, who can reach what. Um, and right now, Iron Lich has played an excellent turn and has stopped me from being able to get to that Reaper right away. So it's, uh, you know, we're still, I'm going in the tank here, trying to figure it out. It's, uh, it's going to be an interesting turn because I really want to lock down as much as I can on his side to allow my slower moving elements the ability to move forward, you know, to get into a better position. Um, so that is why we're, you know, I'm, I'm doing all the different configurations. I'm trying to figure out what's the defensive arm, what's the speeds. Uh, and this is where I found out about mobility, pretty much making them speed eight. Um, really scary, um, especially when you could just load up Death Jack, being speed eight. Uh, thankfully, he doesn't have two inch reach on his claws, but uh, still, speed eight is pretty scary for that uh, for for him. So. Now I'm going to try this all over again with the with the uh, the uh, savage. Measuring, pushing, measuring. So, so I think I now have a, a way to at least ways engage the Reaper, or force him to activate something to get rid of the the Savage. So I activate my caster. She does two for um, was it hand of something? Hand of Death or something like that, and then two for Rush to allow him to the one Savage to ignore the uh, the forest, not ignore, it, but you know not suffer from the rough terrain of the forest, and then so she advances up to keep him in control, and then she's sitting on two. The uh, Willbreaker advances puts up uh, Pope Master on it because last thing I want to do is miss that girl um, because she's like defense 14 but they have uh, whatever spell they have gives them plus two because I'm a living model or me minus two because I'm a living model so the sentry advances coming up to get to base to base with uh, we're getting closer to Makeda he uh, riles for, no, nope, nope, sorry, he doesn't riles for one. He puts up his own animus of Honry. Soldier then comes up around. My whole thought is to keep out of Death Jack's threat um, and still be able to get up there in the, in the mix of things. So now the Beast Handlers activate. They come forward. Uh, the one enrages the Savage. And actually, they, both Savages are enraged. Um, both savages now have Puppet Master because the other Will Breaker activated and put Puppet Master up on the other one. And uh, so now it's, uh, I think it's time to fire off the, the first savage who moves up. I use the Puppet Master. I think I'm able to hit her. Oh, no, sorry. I boost after, I buy another attack, and then I boost it after the fact. 
and then I buy an attack on what you call it, the Reaper. Um, not as I'd planned it. I was really hoping I could have killed the girl in the first swing, and then had two additional on the uh, Reaper. But uh, you can never quite have everything you want. So now the Gladiator advances. He puts up Rush on the Savage. The Savage then walks forward. And then uh, he goes and buys and uh, boosts after the fact because of prescience on the Savages. And that's his ability. And then I just advance Mullet Car. And that's it. Crick's turn two. So, begin contemplating how my opponent is kind of not necessarily you know, running full charge up there. Like, I expected him to throw a couple of his savages away to try and tie me up. And so I was kind of prepared to, to deal with them. So as I measure out my angles, I'm thinking I probably want to go with a turn three feet, looking at how the, the board is. I'm not going to commit my forces or all my forces necessarily on this turn, so that's why I'm thinking turn three feet is going to be the most efficient use right now. If I just get rid of the two savages, he's got really nothing more to throw away other than his Eridus bug. So I go ahead and upkeep Cloak of Ash, assign, no, allocate two to the Reaper. And so I just activate Sixius, I move him just close enough to get off Calamity onto the Cyclops Savage. So I boosted a I boost a hit, and I end up missing, so it leaves the Sixius kind of without any focus. But given his position, I don't see any major threats at this point. So immediately go to the Reaper, whose sole purpose was to get rid of Savage number one that's up in my grill. So I end up using every single focus I assigned to him, but the Reaper is then able to get rid of the Savage. So with the Savage that's in the middle disposed of, I'm thinking now's the turn to really let loose with the Raiders. Cloak of Ash, I lost a few more than I wanted to on my opponent's turn, but overall I think I have enough to go ahead and still at least jam my opponent from being able to get near the flags. So once the Reaver is done, go ahead and go with the Raiders who go ahead and who use True Wind to give themselves Pathfinder. My point not necessarily having any range tags kind of, you know, made an easy decision. So I want to use as few Raiders as I can to get rid of the remaining Savage and then jam with the rest. So I commit three because I want to make sure I get rid of the Savage. And then the rest of them just go ahead and... You know, I go ahead and try and charge Eridus with one of them just to see how far she gets, even though I know you can pre-measure. I don't know, just, I still have trouble pre-measuring. <laughs> so once I fail the first charge, I go ahead and run the remaining ones. The one that failed the charge, not necessarily a bad thing, because it puts her in a decent position still. Run the rest out of the forest. Trying to be careful because what I what don't want to do is run them out of command range. I don't want to my sea witch to be an easy target, so I have to kind of hold them back a little bit. So I check the line of sight for the sea witch because I figure I'll move her up as far as far as she needs to, which is only to attack savage. Put the fourth right on savage as far as I want to. Unfortunately, I forget to move one of the Raiders, who I would have moved into the center. And so, with four jamming, four attacking, and one forgotten Raider, I gotta get started on my attack rolls. Well, the Raiders end up being strong enough to take out the second Cyclops Savage, and it's, I mean, barely. It went down to the last attack. Oh, uh, no. My, my dice don't seem to like Mark three, so... I feel as if I'm rolling under average, but 
That's probably just me being paranoid, and I'm sure every gamer has that feeling. Just because when dice fail, it's memorable, versus when they succeed. So I'm able to get rid of the Savage. And I'm thinking I'm kind of setting up a, a good defense here. With my caster not having a focus, it makes me a little paranoid. And so what I do once the Raider's done is I have Erebus run into position. The next turn, Erebus is going to have one of two possible assignments. Either Erebus is going to go after my opponent's objective, or Erebus is going to go after my opponent's warlock. <clears throat> so then, because my opponent had a Savage that frenzied, he's got nothing to even contest the left flag. Run Death Ripper up there to get a control point. I put Advanced Death Jack just enough to be threatening on the next turn, figuring mobility will give him the chance to get to something. So when I get, once I get the rest of my remaining jacks into position to you know, put pressure on the center, I go ahead and activate the carry thralls. Since I didn't have a whole ton of raiders left to jam, I decided I needed to jam with the carry thralls. So the one that was in range of a pain giver taskmaster, or just a pain giver, went ahead and charged, and then I spread the thralls out, the carry thralls, and proceeded to jam my opponent as best I could, figuring that if he were to advance, he'd advance within range of the Cloak of Ash and receive the debuff to his mat. Still careful not to clump up the carry thralls, because I know my opponent has an AoE spell that can destroy them easily. So we're going to go ahead and move forward with my, uh, my turn now. <clears throat> um, and right now I am trying to figure out with Mollet Karn, with Rush, uh, make some speed 8. Charging makes them 11. Plus reach makes it 13 inches. 13 inches of where he can start to where he's swinging on somebody. Um, if I put up the hand of death or hand of fate or hand of whatever it is that Makeda has, that grants him a one inch overtake. Plus with Makeda, he also gets a sidestep. So if I can kill off that one chick there, um, that will give me a three inch advance, you know, two for sidestep, one for overtake. Give me a three inch advance with my initial swing. Then I have a secondary swing that I could swing on to one of those jacks. And then I, I you know, should be close enough, maybe close enough to, to for attacks buying into uh, his caster. Now, scary part is, um, I'm going. It's a, it's an all or nothing gambit. You know, it's one of those things where it's either I'm all in. And after that, the game's over for me. Or I, uh, or, or it happens. So it's kind of uh, one of those, those, those high risk type situations. And you all know me, I'm gonna go for it. Um, well, cause, well, that's what Iron Lich would, you know, would want me to do. So, Activating the you know the will breaker first. He moves over. He uh, puts up uh, Puppet Master on Moloch, and the Beast Handlers activate. They advance. They put up uh, in the uh, Enrage. Uh, the Savage at the top. Moloch Karn, and uh, also the Sentry, because well, I just want to make sure this shit. You know, everything happens. Uh, the second wheel breaker, which I kind of did it backwards, he uh, backs up and actually puts Pope Master on Makeda uh, because, well, Makeda has to be able to kill off two of these uh, whip chicks, um, the Satixus Raiders. So yeah, I'm going to need her to be able to do what she does to make things happen. Um, 
the start first of all I start off with the savage at the top he is barely within control range he kills off the uh, the top uh, the bone chicken that was sitting up there now the gladiator activates he moves sideways to put rush up on mullet Karn. so now I got uh, two of my three pieces I need I have the Pup Master, oh I'm sorry, three of the pieces I need. Pup Master, I have Enrage, I have Rush. So next part is I have to activate my caster. Make sure that uh, she did not move far enough forward to get Mullet Karn out of her area. So she advances, she pops her feet, she kills a model, uh, she gets a point of fury back. She also has Blood Boon, which allows her to cast a three or less spell for free. So that's when she puts the hand of whatever it is up on Moloch. She then buys an attack on the other lady, getting another point of fury back. She then measures out to try to cast Eliminator on that one unit. And uh, I'm just barely in. So I do all, you know, I cast and everything else. I cast and I boost. And I end up missing. Even after the Puppet Master. I end up missing. It deviates. So now it deviates back there. It hits just the one bird. <clears throat> I roll off on the bird, it kills the bird, I go ahead and get a point of fury back. Nice thing about the Eliminator spell, it allows me to move two inches for every model that dies. So I advance just close enough to swing on the one, uh, I guess the leader for the raiders. Um, so I buy an attack, I kill her, I, um, I, I buy an attack, I kill her, I get the point of fury back. Uh, now my uh, ancestral person uh, kills off the two birds with its two swings. That gives me two more points of fury back. The nice thing about Makeda's uh, feet is for every model that ends up dying, they, um, I can either add or remove a point of fury from her or a beast. So it works out really nice because I could go out there, I can spend all I want, drain her completely down. And as long as I still have other uh, um, other models that can kill something that's in her control area, then you know she's going to replenish back. So now it's time for Moloch to do what he does. He advances up. He swings on. He uh, I'm sorry, he doesn't advance up. He charges, press forward, whatever you want to call it, into where the base is. You will see uh, that uh, I use the boost after the fact to get enough to hit the girl. And actually end up killing her. And then I'm going to do the sidestep and overtake as a, sing as a single advance uh, with the widget. So now I just got to swing on one of, the, one of the jacks. I swing on the reaper because, well, if I could kill it, that means another overtake as well. But uh, I knew I wasn't going to be able to do that. So with the with the sidestep, it gets me just within reach range of his caster. Um, oh, with killing off the Stixus Raider, I also am able to remove the one point of fury that he used to boost after the fact um, from charging her. And so he is going in with a four uh, four potential attacks. And uh, so he just uh, keeps on buying attacks, buying and buying. Um, now on this last one, I have the potential to either boost now and roll a three or better, or by another attack. Now I need like a seven or eight to hit, but I choose to boost after the fact. 
and I rolled a three that I need to get just enough to take out uh, Aphixius. Thanks for watching. So, for afterthoughts. Not much to say. My parent, my opponent had Malkarn sitting forever and a day away, and he still got to my caster, which is kind of aggravating because I specifically took measures to make sure that I was not within Malkarn's threat range. But upon review of the game, I did not take into account overtake, which is given to Malkarn by Hand of Fate. So, without Hand of Fate, Malakarn has a 17-inch threat range, which I was not inside. I made sure I was not inside that. But with Overtake, Malakarn's threat range goes up to 19 inches, as long as he kills something with each of his initials. Now, instead of getting that 2 inches on a sidestep, once you, between sidestep and Overtake, you get 3 inches, which allowed my opponent to get within reach range of my caster. My opponent was able to navigate it so that he missed being within two inches of any of the raiders who had Cloak of Ash on them, so he didn't get a Matt D buff. But that also goes back to the fact that I forgot to move a raider, because the one position I would have moved the raider is near the center, so my opponent would have either had a second raider to get rid of, or he would have been in range of that raider to get the Matt D buff. Not that I think it made that much of a difference, but there's possible things to think about going forward.